Chapter Eleven of Farewell Nicola by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven. When I had picked up Nicola, we continued our voyage. Dawn was just breaking, and Venice appeared very strange and uncanny in the weird morning light. A cold wind was blowing in from the sea, and when I experienced its sharpness, I could not help feeling thankful that I had the foresight to bring my cloak. How do you know where the meeting is to take place? I asked after we had been travelling for a few minutes. Because when I am unable to find things out for myself, I have agents who can do it for me, he replied. What would appear difficult in reality is very simple. To reach the place in question, it would be necessary for them to employ gondolas. And for the reason that, as you are aware, there are not many plying in the streets of Venice at such an early hour, it would be incumbent upon them to bespeak them beforehand. A few inquiries among the gondoliers elicited the information I wanted. That point satisfactorily settled, the rest was easy. And do you think we should be there in time to prevent the meeting? I asked. We should be at the rendezvous before they are, he answered, and I have promised you they shall not fight. Comforted by this reassuring news, I settled myself down to watch the tortuous thoroughfares through which we were passing. Presently we passed the church of St. Maria del Formosa, and later the ducal palace, thence out into the commencement of the Grand Canal itself. It was then that Nicola urged the gondoliers, for we had two, to greater speed. Under their powerful strokes the light little craft sped over the smooth bay, past the island of St. Giorgio Maggiore, and then turned almost due south. I thought of Glenbarth, and wondered what his feelings were at that moment. At last I began to have an inkling of our destination. We were proceeding in the direction of the Lido, and it was upon the sandy beach that separates the lagoons and Venice from the open sea that the duel was to be fought. Presently we landed, and Nicola said something to the gondoliers, who turned their craft and moved slowly away. After walking along the sands for some distance, we hid ourselves at a place where it was possible to see the strip of beach, while we ourselves remained hidden. They will not be here before another ten minutes, said Nicola, consulting his watch. We had a good start of them. Seating ourselves, we awaited their arrival, and while we did so, Nicola talked of the value set upon human life by the inhabitants of different countries. No one was more competent to speak on such a subject than he. We had seen it in every clime, in every phase. He spoke with a bitterness and a greater scorn for the petty vanities and aims of men than I had ever noticed in him before. Suddenly he stopped, and looking towards the left, said, If I'm not mistaken, the Duke of Glenbarth has arrived. I looked in the direction indicated, and was able to descry the tall figure of the Duke coming along the sands. A little later two other persons made their appearance and followed him. One was undoubtedly the Don, but who was the third? As they drew closer, I discovered that he was unknown to me. Not so to Nicola, however. Burma Cedar, he said to himself, and there was an ugly sneer upon his face. The Duke bowed ceremoniously to the two men, and the stranger, having returned his salute, knelt upon the sand and proceeded to open a box he had brought with him. From it he produced a pair of pistols which he loaded with ostentatious care. The work finished, he took them by their barrels and gave Glenbarth his choice. The Spaniard, I noticed, was dressed entirely in black, not showing a particle of white. The Duke was attired very much as usual. When each had taken a pistol, the stranger measured the distance upon the sands and allotted them their respective positions. By this time I was in such a fever of excitement that Nicola laid his hand upon my arm to restrain me. Wait, he whispered. I have not pledged you my word that your friend shall not be hurt. Do not interrupt them yet. I have my suspicions, and I am anxious to confirm them. I accordingly waited, but though it was only for a few seconds, it seemed to me an eternity. The two men were in position, and the stranger, I gather, was giving him their final instructions. They were to stand with their faces turned from each other, and at the word of command were to wheel round and fire. In a flash I saw what Nicola had in his mind. The stranger was favouring the Don, for while Glenbarth would have faithfully carried out his portion of the contract, the Spaniard did not turn at all, a fact which his opponent was scarcely likely to become aware of. 
seeing that he would in all probability have a bullet in his heart before he had had time to realise the trick that had been played upon him. The stranger raised his hand above his head and was about to give the signal when Nicola sprang from beside me and in a loud voice called them to stop. I rose to my feet at the same instant and followed him across the sands to where the men stood. I shall do nothing of the kind, the Duke returned. On learning this, Nicola took him to one side and talked earnestly with him for a few minutes. Then, still with his hand upon the other's arm, led him back to where we were standing. I express my regret for having challenged you, said Glenbarth, but with no good grace. I thank you, your grace, said Nicola. And then turning to the Don, he went, And now, Don Martinez, I hope you will apologise to the Duke for the insults that occasioned the challenge. With an oath, the Spaniard vowed that he was the last man to do anything of the kind. He had never apologised to any man in his life, and he was not going to do so now, with more to the same effect. Then Nicola fixed his glittering eyes upon him. His voice, however, when he spoke, was as conciliatory as ever. To oblige me, you will do it, he said, and drawing a little closer to him, he murmured something that we could not hear. The effect upon the Don was magical. His face turned a leaden hue, and for a moment I thought he would have fallen, but he recovered his self-possession with an effort, and muttered the apology Nicola had demanded of him. I thank you, gentlemen, said Nicola. Now, with your permission, we will return to the city. Here he wheeled round upon the stranger and continued, This is not the first of these little affairs which you have played a part. You have been warned before, profit by it, for the time may come when it will be too late. Remember Pietro Salome. I don't know who Pietro Salome may have been, but I know that the mere mention of his name was sufficient to take all the swagger out of the stranger. He fell to pieces like a house of cards. Now, gentlemen, let us be moving, said Nicola, and taking the Don with him, he set off quickly in the direction of the spot where we had disembarked from the gondola. I followed with the Duke. My dear boy, I said as we walked along, why on earth did you do it? Is your life so little value to yourself or to your friends that you try to throw it away in this reckless fashion? I'm the most miserable brute on the face of the earth, he replied. I think it would have been far better for me had I been shot back there. Look here, Glenbarth, I said with some anger. If you talk nonsense in this manner, I shall begin to think you are not accountable for your actions. What on earth have you got to be so unhappy about? You know very well, he answered gloomily. You're making yourself miserable because Miss Trevor will not marry you, I said. You've not asked her. How therefore can you tell? But she seems to prefer Don Martinez, he went on. Oh, fiddlesticks, I answered. I quite certain she hasn't thought of him in that way. Now I'm going to talk plainly to you. I've made up my mind that we leave for Rome today. We shall spend a fortnight there, and you should have a fair opportunity of putting the question to Miss Trevor. If you cannot do it in that time, well, all I can say is you're not the man I took you for. You must remember one thing, however. I'll have no more of this nonsense. It's all very well for a Spanish braggart to go swaggering about the world, endeavouring to put bullets into inoffensive people, but it's not the thing for an English gentleman. I'm sorry, Dick. Try to forgive me. You won't tell Lady Hatteras, will you? She knows already, I answered. I don't fancy you'd get much sympathy from her. Try for a moment to picture what their feelings would have been. Mine may be left out of the question. If you'd been lying dead on the beach yonder, think of your relations at home. What would they have said and thought? And for what? Because he insulted me, Glenbarth replied. Was I to put up with that? You should have treated him with a contempt he merited. But there, do not let us discuss the matter any further. All's well that ends well. I don't think we shall see much more of the Don. When we reached the gondolas, Nicola took me aside. You'd better return to the city with the Duke in one, he said. I will take the Don back in another. What about the other fellow? I inquired. Let him swim, if he likes, said Nicola with a shrug of his shoulders. By the way, I suppose you saw what took place back yonder? I nodded. And say nothing about it, he replied. Such matters are best kept to oneself. The very sober-minded and reflective young man that sat down to breakfast with us that morning. My wife, seeing how matters stood, laid herself out to be especially kind to him. So affable indeed was she that Miss Trevor regarded her with considerable surprise. During the meal, the journey to Rome was discussed, and it was decided that I should telegraph for our old rooms, and that we should leave Venice at half-past two. 
this arrangement was duly carried out and nightfall saw us well advanced on our journey to the capital the journey is so well known that i need not attempt to describe it here only one incident struck me as remarkable about it no sooner had we crossed the railway bridge that unites venice with the mainland than miss trevor's lethargy if i may so describe it suddenly left her she seemed to be her old self instantly it was though she had at last thrown off the load under which she had so long been staggering she laughed and joked with my wife teased her father was even inclined to be flippant with the head of the family after the events of the morning the effect upon the duke was just what was wanted in due course we reached rome and restored ourselves at our old quarters in the piazza barberini from that moment the time we had allowed ourselves sped by on lightning wings we seemed scarcely to have got there before it was time to go back to venice it was unfortunately necessary for the dean to return to england at the end of our stay in rome and though it was considerably out of his way he proposed journeying thither by way of venice the change had certainly done his daughter good she was quite her old self once more and the listless preoccupied air that had taken such a hold upon her in venice had entirely disappeared make the most of the eternal city my wife announced at dinner on the eve of our departure for to-morrow morning you will look your last upon it the dragon who has us in his power has issued his decree and like the laws of the medes and persians changes not a dragon i answered you should say the family scapegoat i protest to you my dear dean that it is most unfair if it is some disagreeable duty to be performed then it is by my order if it is something that will bestow happiness upon another then it is my lady that gets the credit a very proper arrangement said my wife as i am sure the dean will agree with me i agree with you in everything replied the polite old gentleman could i do otherwise i appeal to the duke then is it your grace's opinion that a husband should of necessity take upon himself the properties of a dragon i'm not going to be drawn into an argument with you he said if lady hatteras calls you a dragon then a dragon you must remain until the end of the chapter as far as i'm concerned phyllis is always right answered miss trevor unblushingly i give in i said in mock despair if all of you are against me i am undone it was a beautiful moonlit night when we rose from dinner and it was arranged that our last evening in rome should be spent in a visit to the Colosseum. Carriage was immediately ordered, and when the ladies had wrapped themselves up warmly, we set off. To those unfortunate individuals who have not had an opportunity of visiting that ancient structure, I can only justify my incompetency by saying that it would be well nigh impossible to furnish a description that would give them an adequate idea of the feeling of awe it inspires in one. By moonlight, it presents a picture that for solemn grandeur is to my thinking without its equal in the world pompeii by moonlight suggests reflections the great square of st mark's in venice seen by the same mellow light is a sight never to be forgotten but in my humble opinion the Colosseum eclipses them all we entered it and stood in the great ring looking up at the tiers of seats and recalling its past the dean was profoundly impressed and spoke of the men who had given up their lives in martyrdom within those great walls how many of the crowd gathered here to witness the agony of the tortured christians he said believed that the very religion which they so heartily despised was destined to sway the world and to see the mighty Colosseum and the mighty of power that built it a ruin it is a wonderful thought after the dean's speech we crossed to a spot where the better view was obtainable it was only then that we discovered that the duke and miss trevor were not of our party when however it was time to return they emerged from the shadow and followed us out both were unusually silent and my wife putting two and two together in her own fashion came to the conclusion they had quarrelled when later on the duke and i were alone together and the ladies and the dean had retired to their respective rooms i was about to take him to task when he stopped me dick old man he said with a solemnity that could not have been greater had he been telling me of some great tragedy i want you to give me your congratulations miss trevor has consented to become my wife i was so surprised i scarcely knew what to do or say gracious ma'am why are you so downcast i replied i had made up my mind that she had refused you i'm far from being downcast he said as solemnly as before 
I'm the happiest man in the world. Can't you understand how I feel? Somehow, now that it is over and I've won her, it seems so great a thing that it almost overwhelms me. You don't know, Dick, how proud I am that she should have taken me. And so you ought to be, I said enthusiastically. I have a splendid wife and I know you will make a good husband. I don't deserve it, Dick, he continued in humiliating self-abasement. She's too good for me, much too good. I remember that I said the same thing myself, I replied. Come to me in five years' time and let me hear what you have to say then. Confound you, he answered. Why do you talk like that? Because it's the way of the world, my lad, I answered. But there, you'll learn all for yourself soon enough. And let me order a whisky and potash for you, and then off you go to bed. A whisky and potash, he cried with horror depicted on his face. Do you think I'm going to drink whisky on a night that she's accepting me? You must be mad. Well, have it your own way, I answered. For my own part, I have no such scruples. I have been married too long. I rang the bell, and when my refreshment was brought to me, drank it slowly as became a philosopher. It would appear that Miss Trevor had already told my wife, for I was destined to listen to a considerable amount of information concerning it before I was allowed to close my eyes that night. I always said they were suited to each other, she observed. She will make an ideal duchess. And I think he may consider himself a very lucky fellow. What did he say about it? He admitted that he was not nearly good enough for her. That was nice of him, but what did you say? I told him to come to me in five years' time and let me hear what he had to say then, I answered with a yawn. I had no idea that I should get into trouble over that remark. And I was not mistaken. I was told that as it was an unfeeling thing to have said, that it was not the sort of idea to put into a young man's head at such a time, and that if everyone had such a good wife as some other people she could name, they would have reason to thank their good fortune. I'm not mistaken. You told me you were not good enough for me when I accepted you, she retorted. What do you say now? Exactly what I said then, I answered diplomatically. I am not good enough for you. You should have married the dean. He will be Glenbarth's father-in-law directly, I said with a chuckle. And then that young man will have to drink his claret and listen to his sermons. In consideration of that, I will forgive him all his sins against me. Then I fell asleep to dream that I was a rival of St. George chasing a dragon over the seats of the Colosseum. To find, when I had run into earth, that he had assumed human shape. and was no other than my old friend, the Dean of Bedminster. Next morning, the young couple's behaviour at breakfast was circumspection itself. The worthy old dean ate his breakfast, unconscious of the shell that was to be dropped into his camp an hour later, while my wife purred approval over the teapot. Meanwhile, I wondered what Nicola would have to say when he heard of the engagement. After the meal was over, we left the duke and dean together. Somehow, I don't think Glenbarth was exactly at his ease. When he reappeared half an hour later and shook me by the hand, he vowed that the old gentleman was the biggest trump in the world, and that I was the next. From this I gathered that the matter had been satisfactorily settled, and that so far as his parental consent was concerned, Miss Gertrude Trevor was likely to become the Duchess of Glenbarth, without any unnecessary delay. Though there was not much time to spare before our train started, there was still sufficient for the lovers to make a journey to the Piazza di Trevi, where the magnificent diamond ring was purchased to celebrate the engagement. A bracelet would have made any woman's mouth water was also dedicated for the same purpose. A memorial bracelet in the Etruscan model was next purchased for my wife. It was handed to her later on by her grateful friends. You did so much for us, said the Duke simply, when Miss Trevor made the presentation. My lady thereupon kissed Miss Trevor and thanked the Duke while I looked on in amazement. Come now, I said, I call that scarcely fair. Is the poor dragon to receive nothing? I was under the impression that I had done more than anyone to bring about this happy result. You shall have our gratitude, Miss Trevor replied. That would be so nice, wouldn't it? I'll see what the Duke says in five years, I answered, and with this Parthian shot I left them. Next morning we reached Venice. The journey had been a very pleasant one. But I must say that I was not sorry when it was over. The picture of two young lovers gazing with devotion into each other's eyes hour after hour is apt to pall upon one. When we had left Mestre behind us and were and approaching the bridge I have described before as connecting Venice with the mainland, when I noticed that Gertrude Trevor had suddenly become silent and preoccupied. She had a headache, she declared to my wife, but thought it would soon pass off. 
In reaching the railway station, we chartered a barker to take us to our hotel. When we reached it, Galaghetti was on the steps to receive us. His honest face beamed with satisfaction, and the compliments he paid my wife when she set foot upon the steps were such as to cover her with confusion. I directed my party to go upstairs, and then drew the old man on one side. Don Jose de Martinos, I asked, knowing that it was sufficient merely to mention his name. He's gone, my lord, Calaghetti replied. Since he was a friend of yours, I am sorry I could not keep him no longer. Perhaps your lordship does not know that he has gambled all his money away, and that he has not even enough left to discharge his indebtedness to me. I certainly did not know it, I replied. I am sorry to hear it. Where is he now? could not say, Galaghetti replied, but doubtless I could find out if your lordship desires to know. Then bidding him good day, I made my way up the stairs, turning over in my mind what I had heard. I was not at all surprised to hear that the Don had come to grief, though I had not expected that the catastrophe would happen in so short a time. It was satisfactory to know, however, that in all probability he would never trouble us again. In the afternoon, according to custom, we spent an hour at Florian's Caff. The Duke and Gertrude strolled up and down, while my wife drew my attention to their happiness. I had on several occasions sang Glen Bath's praises to the Dean, and as a result the old gentleman was charmed with his future son-in-law, and seemed to think that the summit of his ambition had been achieved. During our sojourn on the piazza I kept my eyes open, for I was in hopes of seeing Nicola, but I saw nothing of him. If I was not successful in that way, however, I was more so in another. I had found a budget of letters awaiting me on my return from Rome, and as two of them necessitated my sending telegrams to England, I allowed the rest of the party to return to the hotel by boat, while I made my way to the telegraph office. Having sent them off, walked on to the Rio del Barcoli. I gauged a gondola there, and was about to step into it, when I became aware of a man watching me. He proved to be no other than the Spaniard Don Martinos. But so great was the change in him that for a moment I scarcely recognised him. Though only a fortnight had elapsed since I had last seen him, he had shrunk to what was only a shadow of his former self. His face was of a pasty, fishy whiteness. His eyes had a light in them that I had not seen there before. For the moment I thought he had been drinking, and this unnatural appearance was the result. Remembering his murderous intention on the morning of the frustrated duel, I felt inclined not to speak to him. My pity, however, got the better of me, and I bade him good day. He did not return my salutation, however, but looked at me as if I was someone he had seen before, but could not remember where. I then addressed him by name. In reply, he beckoned me to follow him out of earshot of the gondolier. I cannot remember your name, he said, gripping me by the arm, but I know that I have met you before. I cannot remember anything now, because, because, here he paused and put his hand to his forehead, as if he were in pain. I endeavoured to make him understand who I was, but without success. He shook his head and looked at me, talking for a moment in Italian, then in Spanish, with interludes of English. A more pitiable condition for a man to get into could scarcely be imagined. At last I tried him with a question that I thought might have some effect upon him. Have you met Dr. Nicola lately? I inquired. The effect it produced upon him was instantaneous. He shrunk from me as if he had been struck, and leaning against the wall of the house behind him, trembled like an aspen leaf. For a man usually so self assertive, one might almost say so aggressive, here was a terrible change. I was more than ever at a loss to account for it. He is the last man I should have thought would have been taken in such a way. Don't tell him. You must not tell him. Promise me that you will not do so, he whispered in English. He would punish me if he knew, and, and here he fell to whimpering like a child who feared chastisement. It was not a pretty exhibition, and I was more shocked by it than I can say. At this juncture I remembered the fact that he was without means, and as my heart had been touched by his pathetic condition, I was anxious to render him such assistance as was in my power. For this reason I endeavoured to press a loan upon him, telling him that he could repay me when things brightened. No, no, he answered with a flash of his old spirit. He then added in a whisper, he would know of it. Who would know of it, I asked. Dr. Nicola, he answered. Then laying his hand upon my arm again, and placing his mouth close to my ear, 
as if he were anxious to make sure that no one else should hear he went on i would rather die of starvation in the streets than fall into his hands look at me he continued after a moment's pause look at what i am i tell you he's got me body and soul i cannot escape from him i have no will but his and he is killing me inch by inch i've tried to escape but it's impossible if I were on the other side of the world and he wanted me, I should be obliged to come. Then with another change, as swift as he thought, he began to defy Nicola, vowing that he would go away, that nothing should ever induce him to see him again. But a moment later he was back in his old condition once more. Farewell, Signor, he whispered. I must be going. There is no time to lose. He is awaiting me. But you have not told me where you are living now. Cannot you guess, he answered, still in the same curious voice. My home is the Palace Ravici in the Rio del Consiglio. Here was a surprise indeed. The Don had gone to live with Nicola. Was it kindness that had induced the latter to take him in? If not, what were his reasons for so doing? End of chapter 11A Farewell to Nicola by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. As may be supposed, my meeting with the Don afforded me abundant food for reflection. Was it true, as he had said, that in his hour of distress Nicola had afforded him an asylum? And if so, why was the latter doing so? I knew Nicola too well by this time to doubt that he had some good and sufficient reason for his action. Lurking at the back of my mind was a hideous suspicion that, although I tried my hardest not to think of it, would not allow itself to be banished altogether. I could not but remember the story Nicola had told me on that eventful evening concerning his early life, and the chance remark he had let fall one day that he knew more about the man Don Martinez than I supposed only tended to confirm it. If that were so, and he still cherished as I had not the least doubt he did, for Nicola was one who never forgave or forgot the same undying hatred and desire for vengeance against his old enemy, the son of his mother's betrayer, then there was, but here I was compelled to stop. I could not go on. The death-like face of the man I had just left rose before my mind's eye like an accusing angel whereupon i made a resolution that i would think no more of him nor would i say anything to any member of our party concerning my meeting with him that afternoon it is superfluous to remark that the latter resolve was more easily kept than the former the first dinner in venice after our return was far from being a success miss gertrude's headache instead of leaving her had become so bad she was compelled to go forthwith to bed leaving glenbarth in despair and the rest of our party as low-spirited as possible. Next morning she declared she was a little better, though she complained of having passed a wretched night. I had such horrible dreams, she told my wife, and when I woke up I scarcely dared close my eyes again. I cannot remember quite what it was she said she dreamt, said Phyllis, when she had told me the story, but I know it had something to do with Dr. Nicola and his dreadful house, and that it frightened her terribly. The girl certainly looked pale and haggard, but not a bit like the happy creature who had stepped into the train at Rome. Heaven grant that there is not more trouble ahead, I said to myself as I smoked my pipe and thought over the matter. I am beginning to wish we had not come to Venice at all. In that case we should not have seen Dr. Nicola, nor the Don. Miss Trevor would not have been in this state, and I should not have been haunted day and night with this horrible suspicion of foul play. It was no use, however, talking of what might or might not have happened. It was sufficient that the things I have narrated had come to pass, and I must endeavour to derive what satisfaction I could from the reflection that I had done all that was possible under the circumstances. On the day following our return to Venice, the Dean of Bedminster set off for England. I fancy he was sorry to go, but of one thing I am quite sure, and that was we regretted losing him. It was arranged that as soon as we returned to England, we should pay him a visit at Bedminster and the duke should accompany us transparently honest though he was in all his things i fancy the old man had a touch of vanity in his composition 
and I could quite understand that he would be anxious to show off his future son-in-law before the society of his quiet cathedral town. On the night following his departure, I had the most terrible dream I have had in my life. Though some time has elapsed since then, I can still recall the fright it gave me. My wife declares that she could see the effect of it upon my face for more than a day afterwards. But this, I think, is going a little too far. I am willing, however, to admit that it made a very great impression upon me at the time, the more so for the reason that it touched my thought, and I was quite at a loss to understand it. It was night, I remember, and I just entered the Palace of Vici. I must have been invisible, for though I stood in the room with Nicola, he did not appear to be aware of my presence. As usual, he was at work upon some of his chemical experiments, and I looked at his face and saw that it wore an expression I had never seen there before. I can describe it best by saying that it was one of absolute cruelty, unrelieved by even the smallest gleam of pity, and yet it was not cruelty in the accepted meaning of the word, so much as an overwhelming desire to punish and avenge. I am quite aware on reading over what I have just written that my inability to convey the exact impression renders my meaning obscure, yet I can do no more. It was a look beyond the power of my pen to describe. Presently he put down the glass he held in his hand, and looked up with his head a little to one side, as if he were listening for some sound in the adjoining room. There was a shuffling footstep in the corridor outside, and then the door opened, and there entered a figure so awful that I shrank back from it appalled. It was Don Martinez, and yet it was not the Don. The face and the height were perhaps the same, but the man himself was, oh, so different. On seeing Nicola, he shambled forward rather than walked, and dropped in a heat at his feet, clutching his knees and making a feeble whining noise, not unlike that of an animal in pain. Get up, said Nicola sternly, and as he said it, he pointed to a couch on the further side of the room. The man went and stretched himself out upon it as if in obedience to some unspoken command. Nicola followed him, and having exposed the other's chest, took from the table what looked like a hypodermic syringe filled it from one of the graduated glasses upon the table, and injected the contents beneath the man's prostrate skin. An immediate and violent fit of trembling was the result, followed by awful contortions of the face, and suddenly he stiffened himself out and lay like one dead. Taking his watch from his pocket, Nicola made a careful note of the time. So vivid was my dream that I can even remember hearing the ticking of the watch. Minute after minute went by, until at last the Don opened his eyes. Then I realised that the man was no longer a human being, but an animal. He uttered horrible noises in his throat that were not unlike the short, sharp bark of a wolf. And when Nicola bade him move, he crawled upon the floor like a dog. After that, he retreated to a corner, where he crouched and glowered upon his master, as if he were prepared at any moment to spring upon him and drag him down. As one throws a bone to a dog, so did Nicola toss him food. He devoured it ravenously, as would a starving cur. There was foam at the corners of his mouth, and the light of madness in his eyes. Nicola returned to the table and began to pour some liquid into a glass. So busily occupied was he that he did not see the thing, cannot call it a man, in the corner get on to his feet. He had taken up a small tube and was stirring the contents of the glass with it, when the other was less than a couple of feet from him. I tried to warn him of his danger, only to find that I could not utter a word. Then the object turned upon him and clawed at his throat. He turned, and a moment later the madman was lying whining feebly upon the floor, and Nicola was wiping the blood from a scratch on his left-hand side of his throat. At that moment I awoke to find myself sitting up in bed with the perspiration streaming down my face. I have had such an awful dream, I said, in answer to my wife's startled inquiry as to what was the matter. I don't know that I've ever been so frightened before. You are trembling now, said my wife. Try not to think of it, dear. Remember, it was only a dream. That it was something more than a mere dream, I felt certain. It was so complete and dovetailed so exactly with my horrible suspicions that I could not altogether consign it to the realms of fancy. Fearing a repetition if I attempted to go to sleep again, I switched on the electric light and endeavoured to interest myself in a book. But it was of no use. The face of the poor brute I had seen crouching in the corner 
haunted me continually and would not be dispelled never in my life before i had been so thankful to see the dawn at breakfast my wife commented upon my dream miss trevor however said nothing it became quieter and more distracted every day towards evening glenbarth spoke to me concerning her i don't know what to make of it all he said anxiously she assures me that she's perfectly well and happy but seeing the condition she is in i can scarcely believe that it is as much as i can do to get a word out of her if i didn't know that she loves me i should begin to imagine that she regretted having promised to be my wife i don't think you need to be afraid of that i answered one only has to look at her face to see how deeply attached she is to you the truth of the whole matter is my dear fellow i've come to the conclusion that we have had enough of venice nicola is at the bottom of our troubles and the sooner we see the last of him the better it will be for all parties concerned hear hear to that he answered fervently deeply grateful though i am to him for what he did when gertrude was ill i can honestly say that i never want to see him again at luncheon that day i accordingly broached the subject of our return to england it was received by my wife and the duke with unfeigned satisfaction and by miss trevor with what appeared to be approval it struck me however that she did not seem so anxious to leave as i expected she would be this somewhat puzzled me but i was not destined to remain very long in ignorance of the reason that afternoon i happened to be left alone with her for some little time we talked for a while on a variety of topics but i could see all the time that there was something she was desirous of saying to me though she could not quite make up her mind on how to commence at last she rose and crossing the room took a chair by my side sir richard i'm going to ask a favour of you she said with a faraway look in her eyes let me assure you that it is granted before you ask it i replied will you tell me what it is it may appear strange to you she said but i have a conviction absurd superstitious or whatever you may term it that some great misfortune will befall me if i leave venice just yet i am not my own mistress and must stay i want you to arrange it this was a nice sort of shell to have dropped into one's camp particularly at such a time and under such circumstances and i scarcely knew what reply to make what possible misfortune could befall you i asked i cannot say she replied i am only certain that i must remain for a little while longer you can have no idea what i have suffered lately bear with me sir richard here she lifted a face of piteous entreaty to me which i was powerless to resist adding i implore you not to be angry with me is it likely that i should be angry with you miss gertrude i replied why should i be if you really desire to remain for a little longer there is nothing to prevent it but you must not allow yourself to become ill again believe me it is only your imagination that's playing tricks with you ah you do not know everything she answered every night i have such terrible dreams that i have come to dread going to bed i thought of my own dream on the previous night and could well understand how she felt after her last remark she was silent for some moments that there was something still to come i could see but what it was i had no more idea than a child at last she spoke sir richard she said would you mind very much if i were to ask you a most important question i scarcely like to do so but i know that you are my friend and that you will give me good advice i will endeavour to do so i replied what is the question you wish to ask me it's about my engagement she replied you know how good and unselfish the duke is and how truly he believes in me i could not bear to bring trouble upon him but in love there should be no secrets nothing should be hidden from the other yet i feel i am hiding so much can you understand what i mean in a great measure i answered but i should like you to do so thoroughly miss gertrude if i may hazard a guess i should say that you've been dreaming about dr nikola again yes she answered after a moment's hesitation absurd though it may be i can think of no one else he weighs upon my spirits like lead and yet i know that i should be grateful to him for all he did to me when i was so ill but for him i should not be alive now i'm afraid that you've been allowing the thought of your recent danger to lie too heavily upon your mind i continued remember that this is the nineteenth century and there are no such things as you think nikola would have you believe but when i know that there are she asked looking at me reproachfully ah sir richard she continued if you knew all that i do you would pity me 
that no one will ever know and i cannot tell them but one thing is quite certain i must stay in venice for the present happen what may something tells me so day and night and when i think of the duke my heart well nigh breaks for i fear i should bring trouble upon him i did my best to comfort her promised that if she really desired to remain in venice i would arrange it for her and by doing so committed myself to a policy that i very well knew when i came to consider it later it was not expedient and very far from being judicious regarded seriously in a sober commonplace light the whole affair seems too absurd and yet at the same time nothing could possibly have been of more real or earnest when she had heard me out she thanked me very prettily for the interest i had taken and then with a little sigh that went to my heart left the room later in the afternoon i broke the news to my wife and told her of the promise i had given gertrude but what does it all mean dick she asked looking at me with startled eyes what is it she fears will happen if she goes away from venice that is what i cannot get her to say i replied indeed i am not altogether certain that she knows herself it's a most perplexing business and i wish to goodness i had never had anything to do with it the better plan i think would be to humour her to keep her as cheerful as we can and when the proper time arrives get her away from venice and home to england as quickly as we can my wife agreed with me on this point and our course of action was thereupon settled later in the afternoon i made a resolution my own suspicions concerning the wretched martinos were growing so intolerable that i could bear them no longer the memory of the dream i had had on the previous night was never absent from my thoughts and i felt that unless i could set matters right once and for all and convince myself they were not as i suspected with anstruther's friend i should be unable to close my eyes when i next went to bed for this reason i determined to set off to the palace revici at once to have an interview with nikola in the hope of being able to extort some information from him perhaps after all i argued i am worrying myself unnecessarily there may be no connection between martinos and that south american i determined however to set the matter at rest that afternoon accordingly at four o'clock i made an excuse and departed for the rio di consiglio it was a dark cloudy afternoon and the house as i approached it looked drearier if such a thing were possible than i had ever seen it i disembarked from my gondola at the steps and having bade the man wait for me which he did on the other side of the street i rang the bell the same old servant whom i had remembered having seen on previous occasions answered it and informed me that his master was not at home but that he expected him every minute i determined to wait for him and ascended the stairs to his room the windows were open and where i stood i could watch the gondolier placidly eating his bread and onions on the other side of the street as far as i could see there was no change in the room itself the centre table was as usual littered with papers and books that near the window was covered with chemical apparatus while the old black cat was fast asleep upon the couch on the other side the oriental rug described in another place covered the ominous trap door so that no portion of it could be seen i was still standing at the window looking down upon the canal below when the door at the further end softly opened and a face looked in at me good heavens i can even now feel the horror which swept over me it was the countenance of don martinez but so changed even from that what it had been when i had seen him in the rio del baccaroli that i scarcely recognised it it was like the face of an animal and of a madman if such a thing could be combined he looked at me and then withdrew closing the door behind him only to reopen it a few moments later having apparently made sure that i was alone he crept in and crossing the room approached me for a moment i was at a loss how to act i was not afraid that the poor wretch might do me any mischief but my whole being shrank from him with a physical revulsion beyond all description in words i can understand now something of the dislike my wife and the duke declared they entertained for him on tiptoe with his finger to his lips as if to enjoin silence he crept towards me muttering something in spanish that i could not understand and then in english he continued hush senor can you not see them he pointed his hand in various directions as if he could see the figures of men and women moving about the apartment once he bowed low as if to some imaginary dignitary drawing back at the same time as if to permit him to pass and turning to me he continued do you know who that is 
no then i will tell you senor that is the most noble admiral revici the owner of this house then for a short time he stood silent picking feebly at his fingers and regarding me and ever and anon from the corner of his eye suddenly there was a sharp quick step in the corridor outside the handle of the door turned and nikola entered the room as his glance fell upon the wretched being at my side a look not unlike that i had seen in my dream flashed into his countenance it was gone again however as suddenly as it had come and he was advancing to greet me with all his old politeness it was then that the folly of my errand was borne in upon me even if my suspicions were correct what could i do and what chance could i hope to have of being able to induce nikola to confide in me meanwhile he had pointed at the door and martinos trembling in every limb was slinking towards it like a whipped hound and at that moment i made a discovery that i confess came near to depriving me of my presence of mind altogether you can judge of its value for yourself when i say that extending to the lobe of nikola's left ear half way down and across his throat was a newly made scar just such a one in fact as would be made by a hand with sharp fingernails clutching at it could my dream have been true after all i cannot tell you how delighted i am to see you my dear sir richard said nikola as he seated himself i understood that you had returned to venice having outgrown the desire to learn how nikola had become aware of anything i merely agreed that we had returned and took the chair he offered me when all the circumstances are taken into consideration i really think that that moment was certainly the most embarrassing of my life nikola's eyes were fixed steadily upon mine and i could see in them what was almost an expression of malicious amusement as usually was making capital out of my awkwardness and as i knew that i could do no good i felt that there was nothing for it but for me to submit then the miserable spaniard's face rose before my mind's eye and i felt that i could not abandon him without an effort to what i knew would be his fate nikola brought me up to the mark even quicker than i expected it's very plain he said with a satirical smile playing around his thin lips that you have come with the intention of saying something important to me what is it at this i rose from my chair and went across the room where he was sitting placing my hand upon his shoulder i looked down into his face took courage and began dear nikola i said you and i have known each other for many years now we have seen some strange things together one of us perhaps less willingly than the other but venture to think however that we have never stood on a stranger or more dangerous ground than we do to-night i am afraid i am scarcely able to follow your meaning he replied i knew that this was not the case but i was equally convinced that to argue the question with him would be worse than useless do you remember the night on which you told me that story concerning the woman who lived in this house who was betrayed by the spaniard and who died on that spanish island i asked he rose hurriedly from his chair and went to the window i heard him catch his breath and i knew that i had moved him at last what of it he inquired turning upon me sharply as he spoke only that i have come to see you concerning the denouement of that story i answered i have come because i cannot possibly stay away you have no idea how deeply i have been thinking over this matter do you think i cannot see through it and read between the lines you told it to me because in some inscrutable fashion of your own you had become aware that don martinez would bring a letter of introduction to me from my friend anstruther remember it was i who introduced him to you do you think that i did not notice the expression that came to your face whenever you looked at him later my suspicions were aroused don was a spaniard he was rich and he had made the mistake of admitting that while he had been in chile he had never been in equinata you persuaded me to bring him to this house and here you obtained your first influence over him my dear hatteras said nikola you are presupposing a great deal you get beyond my depth don't you think it would be wiser if you were to stick to plain facts my suppositions are stronger than my facts i answered you laid yourself out to meet him and your influence over him became greater every day it could be seen in his face he was fascinated and could not escape then he began to gamble and found his money slipping through his fingers like water through a sieve you have come to the conclusion then and i am responsible for that also i did not say that it was your doing exactly i said gathering courage from the calmness of his manner and the attention he was giving me but it fits in too well with the whole scheme to free you entirely from responsibility then look at the change that began to come over the man himself his faculties were leaving him one by one being wiped out just as a schoolboy wipes his lesson from a slate if he'd been an old man i should have said that it was the commencement of his second childhood 
but he's still a comparatively young man you forget that while he'd been gambling he'd also been drinking heavily may not debauchery tell its own tale it is not debauchery that has brought about this terrible change who knows that better than yourself after the duel which you had providentially prevented he went to rome for a fortnight on the afternoon of our return i met him near the telegraph office at first glance i scarcely recognised him so terrible was the change in his appearance if ever a poor wretch was on the verge of idiocy he was that one or ever he informed me he was living with you why should the fact that he was so doing produce such a result i cannot say i dare not try to understand it but for pity's sake nikola by all that you hold dear i implore you to solve the riddle last night i had a dream you are perhaps a believer in dreams he remarked very quietly as if the question scarcely interested him this dream is of a description such as i have never had in my life before i answered disregarding the sneer and then told it to him increasing rather than lessening the abominable details he heard me out without moving a muscle of his face and it was only when i had reached the climax and paused that he spoke this is a strange rigmarole you tell me he said fortunately you confess that it was only a dream dr nikola i cried it was more than a dream to prove it let me ask you how you received that long scratch that shows upon your neck and throat i pointed my finger at it but nikola returned my gaze still without a flicker of his eyelids what if i do admit it he began what if your dream were correct what difference would it make i looked at him in amazement to tell the truth i was more astonished by his admission of the correctness of my suspicions than i should have been had he denied them altogether as it was i was too much overcome to be able to answer him for a few moments come he said answer my question what if i do admit the truth of all you say you confess then that the whole business has been one long scheme to entrap this wretched man and to get him into your power tis he answered still keeping his eyes fixed upon me you see i am candid go on my brain began to reel under the strain placed upon it since he had owned to it what was i to do what could i say sir richard hatteras said nikola approaching a little nearer to me resting one hand upon the table and speaking very impressively i wonder if it has struck you that you are a brave man to come to me to-day and say this to me in the whole circle of the men i know i may declare with truth that i am not aware of one other who would do so much what is this man to you that you should befriend him he would have robbed you of your dearest friend without a second thought as he would rob you of your wife if the idea occurred to him he is without the bowels of compassion the blood of thousands stain his hands and cries out for vengeance he is a fugitive from justice a thief a liar and a traitor to the country he swore to govern as an honest man on a certain little island on the other side of the world there is a lonely churchyard and in that churchyard a still lonelier grave in it lies the body of a woman my mother in this very room that woman was betrayed by his father so in this room also shall that betrayal be avenged i have waited all my life the opportunity has been long in coming now however it has arrived and i am decreed by fate to be the instrument of vengeance i am a tall man but as he said this nicholas seemed to tower over me his face set hard as a rock his eyes blazing like living coals and his voice trembling under the influence of his passion little by little i was growing to think as he did and to look upon martinos as he saw him but this cannot go on i repeated in a last feeble protest against the horror of the thing surely you could not find it in your heart to treat a fellow creature so he is no fellow creature of yours or mine nikola retorted sternly as if he were rebuking a childish mistake would you call the man who had shot down those innocent young men of equitina before their mother's eyes a fellow creature is it possible that the son of a man who so cruelly wronged and betrayed the trusting woman he first saw in this room who led her across the seas to desert her and send her to a grave could be called a man i'll give you one more instance of his barbarity and so saying he threw off the black velvet coat he was wearing and drawing up his right shirt sleeve bade me examine his arm i saw that from the shoulder to the elbow it was covered with scars of old wounds strange white marks in pairs and each about half an inch long these scars he went on were made by his orders and with hot pincers 
when i was a boy and as his negro servants made them he laughed and taunted me with my mother's shame no no this is no man rather a dangerous animal that were best out of the way it has been told to me that you and i shall only meet twice more let these meetings lead you to think better of me the time is not far distant when i must leave the world when that hour arrives there is a lonely monastery in a range of eastern mountains upon which no englishman has ever set his foot of that monastery i shall become an inmate no one outside its walls will ever look upon my face again there i shall work out my destiny and if i have sinned be sure i shall receive my punishment at those hands that alone can bestow it now leave me god help me for the coward i am but the fact remains that i left him without another word End of chapter 12chapter thirteen a farewell to nicola by guy boothby this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen if i were offered my heart's desire in return for so doing i could not tell you how i got home after my interview with nicola at the palace Ravici. i was unconscious of everything save that i had gone to nicola's house in the hope of being able to save the life of a man whom i had the best of reasons for hating and that at the last moment i had turned coward and fled the field no humiliation could have been more complete nicola had won a victory and i knew it and despaired of retrieving it on reaching the hotel i was about to disembark from my gondola when a voice hailed me from another craft proceeding in the direction i had come dick hatteras as i am a sinner it cried don't you know me dick i turned to see a face i well remembered smiling at me from the gondola i immediately bade my own man put me out into the stream which he did and presently the two gondolas lay side by side the man who had hailed me was none other than george beckworth a queensland sugar planter with whom i had been on terms of the most intimate friendship in bygone days and as there was a lady seated beside him i derived the impression that he had married since i had last seen him this is indeed a surprise he said as we shook hands by the way let me introduce you to my wife dick he said this with all the pride of a newly married man my dear this is my old friend dick hatteras of whom i have so often spoken to you what are you doing in venice dick i have my wife and some friends travelling with me i answered we are staying at galagatti's hotel yonder cannot you and your wife dine with us to-night possible i'm afraid he answered we sail to-night in the p and o boat won't you come and dine with us that's equally impossible i replied we have friends with us but i should like to see something of you more before you go and if you will allow me i'll run down after dinner for a chat about old times i should be delighted he answered be sure that you do not forget it having assured him that i would not permit it to escape my memory i bade him good-bye and then returned to my hotel a more fortunate meeting could scarcely have occurred for now i was furnished with an excellent excuse for leaving my party and for being alone for a time once more i felt that i was a coward for not daring to face my fellow men under the circumstances however i knew that it was impossible i could no more have spent the evening listening to glenbarth's happy laughter I could have jumped into the grand canal for the time being the society of my fellow creatures was absolutely distasteful to me on ascending to my rooms i discovered my wife and the duke in the drawing-room and was informed by the latter that miss trevor had again been compelled to retire to her room with a severe headache in that case i am afraid you will only be a small party for dinner i said i am going to ask you to excuse me You've often heard me speak my dear of george beckworth the queensland sugar planter with whom i used to be on such friendly terms in the old days my wife admitted that she remembered hearing me speak of the gentleman in question well he's in venice i replied and he sails tonight by the p and o boat for colombo as it is the last time i should be likely to see him for many years i feel sure you will not mind my accepting his invitation of course not if the duke will excuse you she said and when the question was put to him glenbarth willingly consented to do so i accordingly went to my room to make my toilet and then having bade my wife good-bye i chartered a gondola and ordered the man to row me to the piazza of st mark 
thence i set off for a walk through the city caring little in which way i went i was growing dark by this time and i knew there was little chance of my being recognized or of my recognizing anybody else all the time however my memory was haunted by the recollection of that room at the palace revici and of what was in all probability going on in it my gorge rose at the idea all my manhood revolted from it a loathing of nicola such as i had never known before was succeeded by a deathly chill as i realized how impotent i was to avert the catastrophe what could i do to have attempted to stay him in his course would have been worse than useless while to have appealed to the authorities would only have the effect of putting myself in direct opposition to him and who knew what would happen then i looked at it from another point of view why should i be so anxious to interfere on the wretched spaniard's behalf i had seen his murderous intention on the morning of the frustrated duel i had heard from nicola of the assassination of those unfortunate lads in equitina moreover i was well aware that he was a thief and also a traitor to his country why should he not be punished as he deserved and why should not nicola be his executioner i endeavoured to convince myself that this was only fit and proper retribution but this argument was no more successful than the last had been arguing in this way i walked on and on turning to right or left just as the fancy took me presently i found myself in a portion of the town into which i had never hitherto penetrated at the moment of which i am about to write i was standing in a narrow lane paved with large stones having high dismal houses on either hand suddenly an old man turned the corner and approached me as he passed i saw his face and recognised an individual to whom nicola had spoken in the little church on that memorable evening when he had taken us on a tour of inspection through the city he was visibly agitated and was moreover in hot haste for some reason i cannot explain nor i suppose i shall never be able to do so an intense desire to follow him took possession of it must have been more than a desire for i felt that i must go with him whether i wished to or not i accordingly dived into the house after him and followed him along the passage and up the rickety flight of stairs that ascended from it having attained one floor we continued our ascent the sounds of voices reached us from the different rooms but we saw no one on the second landing the old man paused before a door opened it very softly and entered i followed him and looked about me it was a pathetic scene that met my eyes the room was a poor one and scantily furnished a rough table and a narrow bed were its only furniture on the latter a young man was lying kneeling on the floor beside him holding the thin hands in his own was no less a person than dr nicola himself i saw that he was aware of my presence but he took no more no notice of me than if i had not existed you called me too late my poor antonio he said addressing the old man i followed nothing can save him now he was dying when i arrived on hearing this the old man fell on his knees beside the bed and burst into a flood of weeping nicola placed his hand with a kindly gesture upon the other's shoulder and at the moment that he did so the man upon the bed expired do not grieve for him my friend said nicola believe me it was hopeless from the first he was better as he is then with all the gentleness of a woman he proceeded to comfort the old man whose only son lay dead upon the bed i knew no more of the story than what i have seen or have i heard more of it since but i have been permitted to see another side of his character and one which in the light of existing circumstances was not to be denied he had scarcely finished with his kindly offices before there was a heavy step outside and a black-browed priest entered the room he looked from nicola to myself and then at the dead man upon the bed farewell my good antonio said nicola have no fear remember that your future is in my care then having said something in an undertone to the priest he placed his hand upon my arm and led me from the room when we had left them he murmured in a voice not unlike that which he had addressed the old man hatteras this is another lesson is it so difficult to learn i do not pretend that i made any answer we passed down the stairs together and when we reached the street stood for a moment at the house door you will not be able to understand me he said nevertheless i tell you that the end is brought nearer by that one scene it will not be long before it comes now all things considered i do not know that i shall regret it 
then without another word he strode away into the darkness leaving me to place what construction i pleased upon his last speech for some moments i stood where he had left me pondering over his words and then set off in the direction i had come as may be imagined i felt even less inclined than before for the happy jovial party i knew i should find on board the steamer but i had given my promise and could not get out of it when i reached the piazza of st mark once more i went to the steps and hailed a gondola telling the man to take me to the p and o vessel then lying at anchor in the harbour he did so and i made my way up the accommodation ladder to the deck above to find that the passengers in the first saloon had just finished their dinner and were making their appearance on the promenade deck i inquired of the steward for mr beckworth and discovered him in the act of lighting his cigar at the smoking-room door he greeted me effusively and begged me to remain where i was a while while he went in search of his wife when she arrived i found her to be a pretty little woman with big brown eyes and a sympathetic manner she was good enough to say that she had heard such a lot concerning me from her husband and had always looked forward to making my acquaintance i accepted a cigar from beckworth's case and we then adjourned to the smoking-room for a long talk together when we had comfortably installed ourselves my friend's flow of conversation commenced and i was made aware of all the principal events that had occurred in queensland since my departure I was favoured with his opinion of england which he had never before visited and was furnished with the details as to how he had met his wife and of the happy event with which their courtship had been concluded altogether he said taking one thing with another i don't know that you'd be able to find a much happier fellow in the world than i am at this moment i said i was glad to hear it and as i did so contrasted his breezy happy-go-lucky manner and those of certain other people i had been brought in contact with that day my interview with him must have done me good for i stayed on and the hour was consequently late when i left the ship indeed it wanted only a few minutes of eleven o'clock as I went down the accommodation ladder to the gondola which I had ordered to come for me at ten. Galagatti's Hotel, I said to the man, as quickly as you can. When I had bade my friends good-bye and left the ship, I felt comparatively cheerful, but no sooner had the silence of Venice closed in upon me again than all my old despondency returned to me. A foreboding of coming misfortune settled upon me, and do what I would I could not shake it off. When I reached the hotel, I found that my party had retired to rest. My wife was sleeping quietly, and not feeling inclined for bed, and dreading lest if I did go I might be assailed by more dreams of a similar description to that I had had on the previous night. I resolved to go back to the drawing room and read there for a time. This plan I carried into execution. And taking up a new book in which I was very much interested, I seated myself in an easy chair and determined to peruse it. I found some difficulty, however, in concentrating my attention upon it. My thoughts continuously reverted to my interview that afternoon with Nicola, and also to the scene I had witnessed in the poorer quarter after dark. I suppose eventually I must have fallen asleep. For I remember nothing else, so I awoke to find myself sitting up and listening to a light step in the corridor outside. I looked at my watch to discover the time was exactly a quarter to one in that case as we monopolized the whole of the corridor who could it be in order to find out i went to the door and softly opened it a dim light was always left in the passage throughout the night and by it i was able to see a tall and graceful figure which i instantly recognized making for the secondary stairs at the further end a dim light was always left in the passage throughout the night and by it i was able to see a tall and graceful figure which i instantly recognized making for the secondary stairs at the further end now these stairs so i had been given to understand led to another portion of the hotel to which i had never penetrated why therefore miss trevor was using it at such an hour and above all dressed for going out i could not for the life of me determine i could see that if i was anxious to find out i must be quick so turning swiftly into the room again i picked up my hat and set off in pursuit as the sequel will prove it was perhaps as well that i did so by the time i reached the top of the stairs she was at the bottom and was speeding along another passage to the right at the end of this was a door the fastenings of which she undid 
with an ease and assurance that bewildered me so certain was she of her whereabouts and so easily did she manipulate the heavy door though i felt inclined to believe she must have used that passage many times before at last she opened it and passed out into the darkness drawing it to after her i had paused to watch her now i hastened on even faster than before fearing that if i were not careful i might lose her outside having passed the door i found myself in a narrow lane bounded on either side by high walls and some fifty or sixty yards in extent the lane in its turn opened into a small square out of which led two or three other narrow streets she turned to the left and passed down one of these i followed close upon her heels of all the strange experiences to which our stay in venice had given rise this was certainly one of the most remarkable that gertrude trevor the honest english girl the daughter of a dignitary of the church and a prospective bishop should leave her hotel in the middle of the night in order to wander about the streets with which she was most imperfectly acquainted was a mystery i found difficult to solve when she had crossed the bridge which spanned a small canal she once more turned to the left passed along the footway before a dilapidated palace and then entered a narrow passage on the right the buildings hereabouts were all large and as a natural consequence the streets were so dark that i had some difficulty in keeping her in sight as a matter of fact she had stopped and i was almost upon her before i became aware of it even then she did not seem to realize my presence she was standing before a small door which she was endeavouring to push open and at last she succeeded and without hesitation began to descend some steps inside once more i took up the chase though where we were and what we were going to do there i had not the least idea the small yard in which we found ourselves was stone paved and for this reason i wondered that she did not hear my footsteps it is certain however that she did not for she made for a door i could just discern on the opposite side to that by which we had entered without turning her head it was at this point that i began to wish i had brought a revolver or some weapon with me when she was about to open the door i have just mentioned i called her softly by name and implored her to wait for me but still she took no notice could she be a somnambulist i asked myself but if this were so why had she chosen this particular house having passed the door we stood in a second and larger courtyard it was then that the whole mystery became apparent to me the house to which i had followed her was the palace revici and she was on her way to nicola but for what reason was this a trick of nicola's or had her terrible dreams taken such a hold upon her that she was not responsible for her actions either alternative was bad enough pausing for a moment in the courtyard beside the well she turned quickly to her right hand and began to ascend the stairs towards that awful room which so far as i knew she had never visited before when she reached it i scarcely knew how to act should i enter behind her and accuse nicola of having enticed her there or should i wait outside and overhear what transpired between them at last i made up my mind to adopt the latter course and when she had entered i accordingly remained outside and waited for her through the half-open door i could see nicola stooping over what looked like a microscope at a side table he looked up as miss trevor entered and uttered a cry of surprise as i heard this a sigh of relief escaped me for his action proved to me that her visit had not been anticipated miss trevor he said moving forward to greet her what does this mean how did you get here i have come to you she faltered because i could not remain away i have come to you that i may beg of you that wretched man's life dr nicola i implore you to spare him my dear young lady said nicola with a softness in his voice that reminded me of that i had heard in the death chamber a few hours before you cannot understand what you are doing you must let me take you back to your friends you should not be here at this hour of the night but i was bound to come don't i tell you i could not remain away spare him oh for god's sake spare him you do not know what you are asking you are not yourself to-night i only know that i am thinking of you she answered you must not do it you are so great so powerful that you can afford to forgive take my life rather than harm him i will yield it gladly to save you from this sin to save me i heard him mutter to himself she would save me 
God would never forgive, she continued, still in the same dreamy voice. He moved away from her, and from where I stood I could see how agitated he was. For some moments she knelt looking up at him with arms outstretched in supplication. Then he said something to her in a low voice which I could not catch. Her answer, however, was plain to me. Yes, I have known it always in my dreams, she said. And knowing that, he would still wish me to pardon him. In the name of God, I would urge you to do so, she answered. The safety of your soul depends upon it. Once more Nicola turned away and paced the room. Are you aware that Sir Richard Hatteras was here on the same errand this afternoon? he asked. I know it, she replied, though how she could have done so I could not conceive, nor have I been able to do so since. And does he know that you have come to me now asking me to forgive? He knows it, she answered as before. He followed me here. As she had never looked behind her, how had she known this also? Then Nicola approached the door and threw it open. Come in, Hatteras, he said. Your presence is discovered. For heaven's sake, Nicola, tell me what this means, I cried, seeing that the girl did not turn towards me. Is she asleep, or have you brought your diabolical influence upon her? She is not asleep, and yet she is not conscious of her actions, he answered. There's something in this that passes our philosophy. Had I any idea that she contemplated such a thing, I would have used every effort to prevent it. Miss Trevor, believe me, you must go home with Sir Richard, he continued tenderly, raising the girl to her feet as he spoke. I cannot go until you have sworn to forgive, was her reply. I must have time to think, he answered. In the morning you will know everything. Trust me until then, and remember always that while Nicola lives, he will be grateful. Then he assisted me to conduct her downstairs and across the two courtyards to the little post and door through which we had entered the palace. Have no fear for her, he said, addressing me. She would go home as she came, and in the morning she remember nothing of what has transpired. Then taking her hand in his, he raised it to his lips, and a moment later bade me farewell, and had vanished into the palace once more. As I tracked her from the hotel, so I followed her back to it again. I was none the less anxious, however, if only Nicola would abandon his purpose and release his enemy, her action and my anxiety would not be in vain. But would he do so, and the event of his doing this, would his prophecy that Miss Trevor would in the morning remember nothing of what had transpired prove true? Turning, twisting as before, we proceeded on our way. My chief fear was that the door through which we had made our exit would be found to be shut on our return. Happily, however, this did not prove to be the case. I saw Miss Trevor enter, and then swiftly followed her. She hastened down the passage, ascended the stairs, passed along the corridor, and made her way to her own room. As soon as I had made certain that she was safely there, I went on to my own dressing room, and on entering my wife's apartment, had the good fortune to find her still asleep. I was still more thankful in the morning when I discovered that she had not missed me. And being satisfied on this point, I decided to say nothing whatsoever concerning our adventure. Miss Trevor was the last to put in an appearance at breakfast, and as you may suppose, I scanned her face with some anxiety. She looked pale and worn, but it was evident from her manner when she greeted me that she had not the least idea of what she had done during the night. Nicholas' promise had proved to be true, and for that reason I was more determined than ever to keep my information to myself. Events could not have turned out more fortunately for all parties concerned. Shortly after breakfast, a letter was handed to me, and glancing at the writing, I saw that it was from Nicola. I was alone at the time of receiving it, a fact for which I was grateful. I will leave you to imagine with what impatience I opened it. It was short, and merely contained a request that I would call at the Palace Revici before noon that day, if I could spare the hour. I decided to do so and reach the palace twenty minutes or so before the appointed time. The old servitor, who by this time had become familiar with my face, opened the door and permitted me to enter. I inquired if Dr. Nicola were at home, and to my surprise was informed that he was not. Perhaps your excellency would like to see the other senor, the old man asked, pointing up the stairs. I was about to decline this invitation with all possible haste, when a voice I recognised as that of the don greeted me from the gallery above. Would you come upstairs, Sir Richard, it said. I have a letter for you from my friend, Dr. Nicholas. 
i could scarcely believe the evidence of my eyes and ears and when i reached the room of which i had such terrible recollections my surprise was intensified rather than lessened martinos had gone a, a complete metamorphosis in outward appearance he was no longer the same person who only the day before had filled me with such terrible repulsions if such a thing could be believed he was more like his old self as i had first seen him where is dr nikola i inquired when i looked around the room and noticed the absence of the chemical paraphernalia the multitude of books and the general change in it he went away early this morning the don replied he left a letter for you and requested me to give it to you as soon as you should call i have much pleasure in doing so now i took it and placed it almost mechanically in my pocket are you aware when he will return i asked he will never do so martinos replied i heard the old man below wailing this morning because he had lost the best master he had ever had and you i'm ruined as you know he said without any reference to his illness but the good doctor has been good enough to place twenty thousand lira to my credit i shall go elsewhere to attempt to double it he must have been much better for he smiled in the old deceitful way as he said this remembering what i knew of him i turned from the man in disgust and bidding him good day left the room which i hoped never to see again as long as i might live in the courtyard i encountered the old caretaker once more so the senor nicola has gone away never to return i said that is so senor said the old man with a heavy sigh he's left me a rich man but i do not like to think that i shall never see him again sitting down upon the edge of the well i took from my pocket the letter the don had handed me farewell friend hatteras it began by the time you receive this i shall have left venice never more to set foot in it we shall not meet again i go to the fate which claims me of which i told you think of me sometimes and if it be possible with kindness nicola i rose and moved towards the door placing a gold piece in the old man's hands as i passed him then with a last look at the courtyard i went down the steps and took my place in the gondola with a feeling of sadness in my heart and for the sad destiny of the most wonderful man i have ever known End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of farewell nicola by guy boothby this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen next day much to galaghetti's sorrow we suddenly brought our stay in venice to a conclusion and set off for paris the queen of the adriatic had lost her charm for us and for once in our lives we were not sorry to say good-bye to her the train left the station crossed the bridge to the mainland and was presently speeding on her way across europe ever since the morning miss trevor's spirits had been steadily improving she seemed to have become her old self in a few hours and glenbarth's delight was beautiful to witness he had been through a good deal poor fellow and deserved some recompense for it we had been upwards of an hour upon our way when my wife made a curious remark oh good gracious she said in a hurry to get away we've quite forgotten to say good-bye to dr nicola i saw miss trevor give a little shudder do you know she said i had such a curious dream about him last night i dreamt that i saw him standing in the courtyard of a great building on a mountain side he was dressed in a strange sort of yellow gown not unlike that worn by the buddhist priests and was worn almost to a shadow and looked very old he approached me and taking my hands said something that in the commonplace light of day doesn't seem to have much sense in it but i know it affected me very much at the time what was it i asked trying to keep my voice steady it was this she answered remember that i have forgiven it is for you to forget what could he have meant since it is only a dream it is impossible to say observed my wife and thus saved me the danger of attempting a solution to bring my long narrative to a conclusion i might say that the duke and miss trevor were married last may they spent their honeymoon yachting to the west indies some one proposed that they should visit venice indeed the earl of sellingbourne who had lately purchased the palace of Levici, and had furnished it by the way from the tottenham court road placed it at their disposal 
from what i have been told i gather he was somewhat ill-pleased because his offer was not accepted when the wind howls around the house at night and the world seems very lonely i sometimes try to picture a monastery on a mountainside and then in my fancy i see a yellow-robed mysterious figure whose dark searching eyes look into mine with a light that is no longer of this world to him i cry farewell nicola end of chapter fourteen end of farewell nicola recorded by peter keeble nottingham united kingdom